Good evening, everyone. Happy summer. That's a little more tolerable than a couple days ago. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we do in our lab and how that applies to trying to understand that teenage brain. So usually the way I like to start off is acknowledging the fact that everybody in this room has something in common. And that is that we've all been teenagers, right? So for better or for worse, everybody here has gone through this period of adolescence. Now that might bring smiles to some of your faces or grimaces to others. I mean, this is an interesting time in life. And if we think about all the images we can conjure up to describe being a teenager, some, some people think of this age period as being really a great time. It's exhilarating. It's like skydiving. It's great. You have all these new opportunities and exposures to things. Of course, we know that that is not the whole story. We also know that this time in life in particular can really be a roller coaster ride. So, you know, from month to month, you're up one minute, you're down the next. It could go minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day. And for the teen experiencing this emotional roller coaster ride, that's one thing. For the parent or the, you know, the adults in the life of a teenager, it might look qu like quite a ride. And of course, I would be absolutely remiss if I left out the influence of peers. So when you're a teenager, nobody wants to be the odd duck out. Do I have the right phone? Do I have the right genes? Am I going to the right party? Now, as a neuroscientist, we think about, you know, do I have the right genes in a very different way? And that's some of the work that we're trying to understand. But if you take all of these aspects of being a teenager together, exhilaration, emotionally roller coaster ride, peer influence, and if we think about them, what we're really the goal of being a teenager is to have new experiences, ultimately to make good decisions. In those good decisions, if everything goes well, the teen, the young person, will become an adult. So it's this transition from dependence to independence that we're really talking about. Now, if I talk to the parents of teenagers, you know, I think that we, my kids are very young. They're five and three, so I'm not quite there yet. I think by the time they're teenagers, they are really doomed because I've been talking about the teenage brain for long before they even came into the picture. But what we think about as adults is, yes, I would love my teenager to become independent. So you may think financial independence, you know, get them out of my house, get them doing their own thing. If I talk to the same audience, only the audience is, you know, composed of teenagers themselves, which I've done many, many times. I've had an audience of a thousand teenagers just staring at me. And I will tell you, I've talked to probably some of the brightest neuroscientists in the world. I've talked to some of the most amazing audiences. And I will tell you that more than any other audience that intimidates me, it's those teenagers. I'm always convinced they're looking at me. They're talking about me. I'm, I'm sure my pants are wrong or I have a spot. So they're sizing me up. And I'm thinking back into my life of, wow, wait a minute. I'm playing their game. <laughs> I'm the neuroscientist here. Let's just get back into the discussion. But if you talk to the teenagers, their goal yeah, the whole independence thing sounds nice. They really just want their freedom. So how do they get out into the world and you know, feel like they're making their own decisions and doing all of these things? So it's the same concept from a very different perspective. Whether you are the teenager or you are the adult, everybody has the shared goal. And evolutionarily, I mean, teenagers becoming independent is not new. This has been, you know, for any species that goes through an adolescent period, that's the goal. We have an evolutionary drive to get out of the nest. And that's what teenagers do. There's also an important drive for them to seek out novelty, to be risk takers, because the whole goal is get out of the nest so that I can pass my genes on elsewhere, not within my you know, nest neighborhood. And so there really is an evolutionary drive for this process. It just so happens that our teenagers today don't seek novelty and take risks because they want to just get out of the nest. There are a lot of risks out there that because the brain is kind of wired to be a risk taker, that actually can get them, you know, put them in harm's way. So that's why we really want to understand the biology of this process so we can work with them and we can come up with good strategies to keep them safe because that's really the goal here. Let's help educate them in a way that will instill an ability to make good decisions and, you know, as we're going forward, kind of ensure that we keep them protected from some of the dangers that really exist. How do we do this? We do this by studying the brain. Now, as I said, we've known forever that teenagers go through this period and they get smarter. This is not new information. This is not something novel my lab does. But we really are approaching this in a way. And if you actually look in the scientific literature, so 
PubMed is a search engine that uh, is a National Library of Medicine that if you type in terms adolescent and brain, you can see all the papers that have been, that have been published, the peer-reviewed scientific articles. Now, if you just, I just have to show this for effect because over the last decade, in and of itself, you know, if you just look in the last 10 years, there's been an explosion in how many people are publishing papers on teenage in brain. And you think, well, why is that? Why now? And if we think about it, this whole risk-taking, novelty-seeking thing, oh, this is also a typical age when kids start to experiment with drugs and alcohol. This is also the age when their brain is doing this amazing development. This is also the age when they start to show depression or anxiety or all of the above. And so the reason why there's been really an explosion in this is because in the world of understanding biology of the brain, particularly in humans and studying this using imaging, which we'll talk about in a minute, you know, there are a lot of things that we know and understand, but most people start these studies by studying people with disease. It's important to know what's going on in the brain or what's not going on in the brain. So then it kind of always starts in adults, adults with disease, compare adults without disease, and then, when, then it went to adolescents with disease. And now there is this aha moment of, wait a minute, we don't even understand the process in healthy teens in and of itself. So there's been this explosion because now the technology really permits us to have a window into the brain in a way that we've never actually had before. Now these are similar huge increases in the number of papers that have been published. This is uh, adolescence in psychiatry, so think about uh, psychiatric illness, and then this is adolescence in substance abuse. So across the board, there are a lot of people doing this work. There's a lot of national efforts. There are big grants that have been funded to look at 10,000 kids over the course of 10, you know, 10 years. And so what makes this all possible? It's all because of the technology. Now, like I said, there are things that we have known for a long time. And we know those because we studied either animal models, so we could study teenage animals and see how they progress. We could study people after they've died, so we could study their brains post-mortem. We could study people after they have a brain injury. And all those things have given us a lot of information. But what makes this new is having MRI. So MRI is a non-invasive imaging technology. There's no exposure to anything harmful, no radiation, no x-rays, unlike a CAT scan or a PET scan. And so this is an entirely non-invasive way to have a window into the brain in not only one time. You can scan the brain of a child, an adolescent, over and over and over again, and there are no negative effects of that. So not only can we study one person in one point of time, we can actually follow them longitudinally and be able to look at the time course of their brain development. That is why there's such an explosion. And it works, because if you talk to teenagers, they love the brain science. They see pictures of the brain, and for you know, a first time, they actually believe it. So I could tell them, yes, I'm a neuroscientist. I have pictures of my brain on my phone. I may or may not have pictures of my brain on my phone. <laughs> but the fact that we have technology to actually see what someone's brain is doing is real to them, and it's tangible. And it's not a just-so story. This is based on scientific evidence. And that's really given us a big leap forward in getting kids to pay attention to science. And then the fact that you know, being a neuroscientist is pretty cool in all the tools that kind of go along with it. So kids in science also are really interested. And so if I can kind of give you the neurobiology 101 of how the brain changes, I will take you on a short little journey through this. But probably one of the most interesting things to know, if you don't know this already, is that from the time you're born, your brain increases dramatically in size. That physical three pound mass of tissue in your head increases from the time you're born until you're around age five. By the time you get to be five years old, your brain gets no bigger for the rest of your life. And that sounds a, a little odd because you think, well, a five-year-old compared to a 10-year-old or a 20-year-old, clearly they're much smarter. Why, how could that be? So I like to think about this in terms of the size of the room. The size of your room does not change, but let's say that we have this unfinished basement and we want to do a big construction project. You know, right now, you're just throwing all your stuff down there. It's not really good for anything. Oh, but you decide to renovate. So you're going to put down a carpet and some walls and put in a couch and a TV, and you've taken the same size of the room, but by changing the internal workings of it, you've now changed the function of the room. And that's exactly what's happening in the teenage brain. We're keeping the size of the room the same, but some of the internal changes are really what's permitting kids to get smarter and ultimately to make those good decisions to get to the point of becoming independent. Um, now, there is at some point the brain does start to get smaller. 
Um, but I will tell you that is not my area of, uh, of scientific inquiry, although as a neuroscientist, occupational hazard, sometimes I'm at my desk thinking, is today the day? <laughs> I'm just starting to come down a little bit. But getting back to this idea that by the time you're five or six, your brain size plateaus for the rest of your life, but in the teen years, you have this dramatic renovation that is really what's going to give you function. And then kind of the last little piece of this in, the, in my introduction, you know, it was referred to the fact that I study adolescents and also emerging adults. Who are emerging adults? Emerging adults is kind of a new category of kids that are in the ages of 18 to 24. So they are significantly more independent than kids younger than 18, but they're not quite as independent or advanced as someone older than that. So there's kind of this, what's referred to as an extended period of adolescence, great, right? There's also something called the boomerang generation, where 18, they go off to college or get a job, they go through school, oh, maybe they go to graduate school, and then they kind of boomerang back home for a little while to kind of keep up and gain their financial resources. But the idea here is that even in emerging adulthood, 18 to 24, the process isn't over yet. There are still some really important changes that are occurring, and that is probably one of the most one of the newest pieces of information that we had. People used to think conventionally you get to be 18, right? So you have legal rights, you graduate, you can do a whole host of things, you can get married, you can get a mortgage, you can do a lot of things legally, but the brain is still changing. So that means, yes, there's this great period of opportunity because when the brain is developing, you can do all these great things, but it also means that the brain is very vulnerable. And so that period of vulnerability actually is extended into an important period of time. And so what does this look like at the level of the brain cell or the level of the neuron? So this is a brain cell, otherwise known as a neuron. Uh, these long projections are called axons. Those are what allow neurons to talk to each other. So in your brain, you have billions and billions of neurons. You're born with more neurons than you'll ever have in your entire life. And there are all these very dense populations of cells that are trying to talk to each other. So if we're not changing the size of the room, but we get smarter, what's actually happening? One of the chief processes that happens is something called myelination. So myelination is a process where these connections from neuron to neuron actually get wrapped with an insulation. It's as if, now I think I'm safe with this crowd to talk about the telephone can game. <laughs> yeah, that gets lost on a lot of people. I can't really do that in many audiences anymore. But the idea here is that if you take a copper wire or a plain wire and you wrap it with insulation, the message is gonna get from point A to point B significantly faster and more efficiently. This is how neurons talk to each other. When you myelinate the connections between them, the axons, you have better communications between cells. Embrace yourself, I make really bad jokes. This is how you get better cell service. <laughs> it's important, see that little trickle in your heart rate for a second is what allows you to stay attentive to the conversation. <laughs> There's tricks here. But the idea here is that, okay, so we've added all this myelination. But by conservation of matter, if we're not making the brain bigger, then we also have to take something away, right? To maintain the same size of the room. And that's the other piece of the story, is that at the same time we're myelinating and making the neurons really good communicators, we're also pruning away neurons that we don't need. So remember I said we're born with more neurons than you ever need in your lifetime. And slowly through experience and programming, genetic programming, we prune away the ones that are not necessary. The, born, the brain is born with redundancy. And that is a fantastic thing. But it's also a very energy hungry process. So if we don't need 10 neurons to do the job of five neurons, it makes sense from an energy perspective for our brain to prune away the ones we don't need. And so that's the other side of the story. We keep the best of the best neurons and we make them really good communicators. So we've not changed the size of the brain, but the renovation project has increased our efficiency. Now, if we look at this picture, so this is a brain image as if someone were looking straight ahead at you. And you can see it a little bit here. So this is the gray matter, otherwise known as the neurons or the brain cells that I showed you. These are the connections between them, otherwise known as white matter. Um, you can see it a little bit better in this cartoon. And you don't actually have to be a neuroscientist or a radiologist to see the difference between that picture and over the course of this period of adolescence to see that, wow, those cortical neurons around the outside have really pruned away. And what I'm left with is all this connective tissue. So I have less neurons, but they're really well myelinated and connected. And that is the process of how the brain undergoes this renovation project. Now, million dollar question, everybody wants to know. 
some people more than others want to know. When is the brain adult? So how do we go from a process where we are incredibly dependent on our caretaker, right? We can't eat, we can't walk, we can't do anything. And then slowly over time, you go from this to being these people who may look a little intimidating, they might be taller than you or their voices are different than you or for whatever reason, they just have an air about them that's intimidating. What about the brain is changing? Now the pruning and the myelinating happens pretty much from the time you're born and it happens across, you know, the first things to really develop in the brain are our senses, all the very primitive aspects of how our brains work. So what makes adolescence such a unique period is that, in, you know, these are studies that have been done by many people many different research groups, we can kind of see there's all these dramatic changes and then they slowly taper off. But one of the things that's important to know is where in the brain this is happening. Because like I said, the earliest parts of the brain to develop are the more primitive structures. So my sensory function, my ability to integrate my senses, to be able to think about things. The last part of the brain to come online, which we'll spend most of the rest of the conversation today talking about, is the frontal lobe. That area of brain right behind your forehead that is the last part of the brain to come online. Now, interestingly, if we step back to evolution for one minute, the thing that sets apart humans as a species from lower species is the development of the frontal lobe. So not only evolutionarily, the, the frontal lobe has been the last part of the brain to develop in a way that's give a, given us what we know to be as human abilities, it's also the last part of the brain to develop in humans. So, that's the ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. The idea here is that the last part of the brain evolutionarily that developed is the same part of the brain that develops last. So why is that important? How do we actually get to this point and when does it end? So based on imaging studies, this is not looking at someone's behavior or a score in a test or how well they're doing or if they got a job or if they're holding things down. This is based on neuroscience. When does the pruning in the myelinating plateau? And so the answer to that, and now I will tell you that this is not the same for every person, thank goodness, everybody is not the same, we're not all in the time course, for better or for worse. What we know is that this process really starts to conclude or hit a plateau in the early 20s. Again, later than we thought conventionally. One little sideline, people always want to know, well, what about the effects of digital and media and devices? I can only think that that is another evolution. You know, at one point, we wouldn't probably be in this room because there was no electric light. When we went from having no electric light to having electric light, the brain had to change and adapt to that. Wow, we could stay up later. We didn't rely on candlelight. So the brain had to adapt. And I have to believe that yes, with everything, there is a risk and a harm. So yes, devices for too long, not good for the brain, but it's part of our evolution. We have used that same organ to develop these amazing devices to do things that our brains can't do by themselves. So we have to believe that that is part of the evolutionary process. I think the more we can understand the impact and kind of safeguard that, limit the amount of time, don't do it an hour before you go to sleep, you know, all of these pieces are all the questions that neuroscientists are asking now. But you know, I raise it because we talked about evolution a little bit and it, it, you know, I think the jury is out. Is it good for the brain? Is it bad for the brain? Even if it was bad for the brain, devices are not going away. And we all lean pretty heavily on them. I mean, I maybe can remember about three phone numbers at this point. If I don't have my phone, I can't call anyone. <laughs> so the idea here is that again, the brain kind of starts to plateau. It reaches neurobiological adulthood in the early 20s. So again, pointing to the fact that there is a lot of this pruning and myelinating across all of the brain as we're born and into the teenage period, but it just so happens that the frontal lobe, again, this is the area of the brain, this is as if someone were looking straight ahead. This part of the brain, the frontal lobe, the last part to come online, look at all the functions it's in charge of. It's in charge of attention, working memory, having abstract thought, the what would happen if scenarios. Cognitive control, oh, how do I make a good decision or not? And ultimately, you know, the end all be all, not just in inhibiting a right answer or a wrong answer, but how do I use that to actually then make a good decision? Last part of the brain to come online. And more than any other time in life, the pruning and the myelinating that happens in the frontal lobe is the most rapid. And it is really confined to the second decade of life. And if you think about it, if we're lucky, we will live to be 80, 90, maybe 100. I always reflect on the fact that we are in Boston. We are in the, you know, in the land of medical innovation. We could live for a very long time. New knee, I can 
get a new kidney, a new heart valve. I could do all sorts of things that will extend my life. The one place we have not been successful is finding a way to keep the brain young. And so that hits a lot of people on many levels. If you've watched someone age, it's a very difficult process. So the work we need to do is figure out how do we preserve the brain to live as long as the body? And one of the potential answers to that could really be that if we do the most work to protect the adolescent brain, that might be one of the keys to getting a brain that could live for a very long time along with the body. That's, you know, that's not necessarily based on science yet, but it's an idea. And if we think about, you know, you're not really gonna slap a, a helmet on a teenager's head like through their whole second decade of life, unless they were really cool or they had some other function. But the idea here is that this may be one of the single most important periods of life to make sure that you have efficiency in a brain that will carry you to make those good decisions. I'm feeling particularly passionate about it this evening. So how do we test this? One of the things that I mentioned that the frontal lobe does is to measure something called cognitive control. That's really, you know, the ability to say, Danielle asked me, what is your name? I would say, oh, my name is Marissa. And you think, we don't even think about the fact, why didn't I say that my name was Carol? Why didn't I say that my name was Jane? Well, because that's the wrong answer. But what we take for granted is that for me to give you a right answer, I have to simultaneously hold back every single incorrect answer. That process is actually really energy. It, it's a big energy suck. So it takes a lot of our energy to hold things back. The way we study this in the lab, we use something very simple called a go, no, go task. This is the computerized version of Simon Says Do This. And so what you do is you look at all these different shapes, a large circle, a large square, a small circle. You see the small square. You make a press, make a press. Oh, see the small square. Don't do anything. Simon says do this. Simon says do this. Do this. Don't do that. I'm going to actually give you an opportunity to participate in this experiment. The camera's on me, not on you. So all you have to do is every time you see a large circle, a large square, or a small circle, just give a little hand raise. When you see that small square, keep your hand down. Is everybody ready? Go. Excellent job. So you didn't read the fine print that there would be frontal lobe exercises as well. What a bonus. So I just asked you to do a relatively simple task. You had to hold back the wrong response. If I measure the energy in your brain it takes for you to not respond, it actually takes more energy for your brain to hold back than to make a response. If you have a window into the brain, and what we know is that this is the frontal lobe that does this work, this improves with age. If you look in the brain, what this picture shows you is this is how much more of the adult brain lights up when they are holding back an incorrect response compared to a teenage brain. Now I want to give you one quick little tip that will set you up to try to interpret this is fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, everybody loves these Jackson Pollock like prints of the brain. This is the sexy part of science. It depends on the task you're doing. More activation is not always better. Right? Under some circumstances, you want the brain to be efficient. You don't want to light up your whole brain because that's like, you know, you're, you're out to run the marathon and you sprint the first mile. Not a good idea. In this particular context, what we know is that this is how much more the adult brain lights up than the adolescent brain. If I were to actually compare their performance to yours, those teenagers, pardon the pun, would beat you hands down. They would, their reaction time, significantly fast. Oh, but. If we look to see what the adults are doing, you do significantly better in accuracy. This is the speed versus accuracy trade-off. In order for us to do a better job, we slow down a little bit. But when you're young, you go really fast and you make a lot of errors. When you're older, you slow down a little bit and you have better accuracy. That is what the frontal lobe is doing. This is mediated by that frontal lobe part of the brain. And this is just the beginning piece of being able to hold back incorrect responses. I'm going to do one more experiment with you. This is what I want you to do as quickly as you can, out loud. I just want you to name the colors of the blocks that appear on the screen. In case the colors are off, they are red, green, and blue. OK, doesn't work. Purple, orange, no, red, green, blue. Everybody ready? OK, go. Red, 
Excellent job. Next part of the experiment, as quickly as you can, just read the words on the screen. Everybody ready? Go. Excellent audience participation. So we do this while kids are actually laying in the MRI scanner. We're measuring a signal from their brain during the da 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 We collect the signal. Last part of the experiment, this is what I want you to do. I want you to name the color of the ink the words are written in. And I'm sorry. Ready? Go. <laughs> now that was a great response. I have to tell you, as intimidating as I find the audience when I do this experiment with an audience of a thousand teenagers, they're like, right, right. You can see, you know, they have fun with it and they're trying to do it and it's frustrating. It's all the things that we kind of experience as we're asking our brain to hold back. Now let me ask, Carol, how many times do you think you've done this test with me? At least five, maybe ten. Has it gotten easier? No. No. This is not something you can learn necessarily. And so we ask the question, well, why was that so hard? So you just were exposed to something called the Stroop effect. This was a test that was d designed in the early 1900s and it was really long before we knew about imaging. This was a test designed to test frontal lobe function. And so what we know is that if you take a second, I'm sure you've gotten an email like this before. Most people can read words even when the letters are mixed. The brain is excellent at language and reading. What does that mean? That means that reading is such an automatic practice that you could proofread your email a thousand times, hit send, and recognize that you've misspelled the first word. That is because it is such a potent part of our brain, we have such a language-based brain, that the brain actually fills in the blanks or fixes errors for us. And then you send, you're like, how did I not see that? I spelled my own name wrong. And so, now, naming colors is not hard. My five-year-old and my three-year-old can name colors. But when you pit the two against each other, once you've learned to read and you're off and running, your brain will always want to read. Even though I should do something that's not hard, when I cause a conflict in your brain, which is why I said I was sorry, is then this is the effect that's on the brain. We know that the brain has to work significantly harder to hold back the want and need to read. This is the frontal lobe working, so congratulations, you just completed your second frontal lobe exercise of the evening. Again, this gets better with age. And if you have to guess, what part of the brain do you think lights up while you're doing this task? So in that last part of the condition, this is the unique part of the brain, and again, just a little inside, inside trader tip about understanding what these images say. You know, we use a lot of our brain all the time. Kids always want to know, is it a myth that you only ever use 10% of your brain? Absolute myth. You use all of your brain all the time. It is this fantastic symphony of activity in your brain that produces what looks like flawless behavior for us. My brain had to just do so many things for me to even get that sentence out to you, but we don't think about that. But the idea here is that in that last condition where you had to hold back reading and instead giving the names, we expect that there are parts of the frontal lobe that should be activating. And that's what you see, that these very unique parts of the brain, this is what causes the efficiency of the brain, <coughs> increases significantly as you get older. So behaviorally, they do better. They get more accurate as they get older. And we also have a better defined brain. And so what that means is that when you're younger, you light up a lot of your brain and you don't do as well. As you get older, we go from having this very diffuse activation of the brain to very focal. And that's what you're seeing here. Very focal, you know, pinpoint activation that is going to really be a very efficient utilization of energy. Even over the course of one year in the same teenagers that do this task in the scanner, you can see that their activation changes. And that's what also makes us unique. This is not comparing one group of teenagers that are 12 to another group of teenagers that are 13 because there's a whole host of other things. This is the same kids measured at 12 and 13. In their brains, you can actually see there is a shift in how efficiently they do, and that is tied to how accurate they are. So this is the process of how we start. You know, the end game is make a good decision. But before you can even make the good decision, your brain has to inhibit the wrong answers. And so this is the biology of how that happens, and that all sits right in your frontal lobe. So let's take this out of the lab for a minute. Let's put it in a real context because, yes, scientists are all well and good, but unless we talk about something that really matters or affects kids, here's an example of a context. What should I do after class? The context is you have a math test tomorrow. Again, I always date myself when I talk to the kids because I'm like, okay, you're in class and the bell rings, and they're like, 
what's a bell? I'm like, you don't have bells? Do you just magically know class is over? There's an like electronic signboard or something. But you get the point. You're sitting in class. The bell rings. You have a math test tomorrow. What do you do? Well, it sounds pretty simple. I'm sure your adult brains know what would probably be a good idea. But we know that that might not be the choice that said teenager might make. So, you know, don't even think about it. Bell rings, I gotta go find my friends. I gotta check Facebook, I have to do this, I have to do that. We don't even have to think about that to make that response. Oh, but what if we took a second, thought about it for a minute. Oh, I have to, I have something tomorrow. Oh, a test, I, oh, I should probably study. I could draw, so this is an example of two potential behaviors one could make when the bell rings. How many other lines can I draw of all the other potential things that kids can do besides hang out with friends or you know, study for the test? And we all know that when someone makes a decision, that decision is linked to some sort of an outcome. So chances are you don't study for the test, you're not going to do as well as if you did. And I'm making this very you know, simplistic example for a reason. Because it's not only about using our frontal lobe to think it out for a minute. What would happen if I didn't study tomorrow? I'm guessing they're probably not thinking that when the bell rings. They're going to this quick response. Now it's incredibly important to have a quick response. There is a part of the brain, you know, we're not just talking about the frontal lobe, but um, by show of hands, if you are willing to admit this, how many of you have ever uttered the phrase to your teenager, what were you thinking? Anyone? Has anybody ever said that to yourself? <laughs> Did you maybe say it today? <laughs> I mean, this is such a classic idea of what was I thinking? And you know, it's not just the frontal lobe putting the brakes on. There is a part of the brain, a very primitive part of the brain that exists specifically for our survival. In our survival, you know, oh gee, look at that big lion coming my way. What a nice color fur that, no, get out. Don't think about it, run, save yourself. So the amygdala and other parts of the very primitive part of the brain are in place for a reason to keep us safe and help us survive. So, we have this competition, right? So the bell rings, don't even think about it. The amygdala is often running with the emotional content of, I gotta see my friends, I have to know what happened. But then there's the frontal lobe that takes a little more time to become integrated to say, oh, I should probably study for the test. So it's not just the frontal lobe developing, it's the frontal lobe's ability to put those brakes on the part of the brain that doesn't do any thinking. And so if we have another picture of this, so what are some of the things that the amygdala or the, you know, that primitive part of the brain are important for identifying when we're at risk? And one of those examples is when we look at pictures of fear. So if I had an MRI on all of your brains right now, your amygdala would be activating because when we see things that are fearful, it lights up the part of the brain that says, ah, something about this isn't right. I'm in danger. I need to make sure that I'm safe. And if you actually have a window into the brain, what you see is that in adolescence, as young as seven through 16, that part of the brain activates and it stays pretty consistent throughout most of your life. But the other piece that happens at the same time is the amygdala might activate and stay stable. The frontal lobe only slowly comes online to help with appraisal. So it's not just this quick response of hurry, run out the door, but it's also the ability to put the brakes on. And so, you know, one example I give is, we're sitting here talking about the amygdala and the fire alarm goes off. What's gonna be your response? You're not gonna really think about anything. You're gonna be, where's the exit? How do I get out of here? Is there really a fire? So we all shuffle outside. We're waiting outside, the fire department comes, they you know, turn off the alarm, we all shuffle back in, and I say, okay, so where were we? We were talking about the amygdala, and the fire alarm goes off again. Do you think your brain is gonna have the same reaction the second time around? Probably not, because now the frontal lobe has stepped in to say, oh, you know what? There's no alarm here. That actually happened. I was giving this talk at MIT and the fire alarm really did go off. I was like, I can't make this stuff up. I mean, it was a fantastic example, but that's the whole idea. This part of the brain that might really underlie some of the biggest risk taking in kids has an important role to help us with survival. But the goal here is to find ways that the frontal lobe can help the amygdala make good decisions. We also know that the amygdala will activate to pictures of food. Now, I'm not trying to say the cheeseburgers are necessary for survival, maybe for some, but in this particular study, this was a passive test. There was no test here. They just laid in the scanner and they looked at these pictures. And what we know is that whether it was high calorie foods or low calorie foods, this, these little splotches you're seeing are the amygdala activating. And so what we know is if you are hungry, if you're not satiated, your amygdala is probably lighting up. Now, interestingly, if you look at the adults, 
shown the same exact pictures. There's no test here. They're just passively viewing it. Yes, their amygdala activates. Oh, but what do you see here that you don't see here? The frontal lobe also is activating. So you may think to yourself, well, then why do I make bad food choices sometimes? <laughs> I haven't figured that one out yet, but I'll let you know when I do. But the idea here is that they're looking at the same picture. Now, this is not better or worse. This is different. And so if you have that dialogue with your, with your child, your teenager, and you say, well, what were you thinking? They are not unintelligent creatures. What was the right answer? They knew the right answer, right? Did you say, well, then why did you do it? I don't know. <laughs> like, conceptually, we don't necessarily know why we make those bad decisions. It's just like if you get that email from your colleague that's got a little emotional content, oh, and you're, you're, you're oh, what was I thinking? So I have a very good friend and colleague, Barbara Green. She works. Uh, uh, she's a medical director at South Shore Hospital. She has her own private practice. She's worked with adolescents for 30 years. And she came up with this as a suggestion for parents. And it works really, really well. Something called the 10-10-10 rule. And this is a term that has been borrowed from Susie Orman. Is she a neuroscientist? No. But it works really well with the brain. Because if you have to make an important decision, wait 10 minutes, wait 10 hours, wait 10 days, however important that decision is, Wait. Now, if we integrate this with neuroscience, we're not talking about 10 hours, 10 days, 10 weeks, whatever. We're talking about seconds, 10 seconds. If I stop talking for 10 seconds, you're going to think something's wrong with me. For a neuron, 10 seconds is an eternity. But that might be just enough time for that frontal lobe to squeak in there and be like, hold on, amygdala. So, Right at your response, before you hit send, you set it aside for 10 seconds, 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 days. Chances are you come back to it and you're like, oh, I can't believe I was going to send that. <laughs> Let the frontal lobe step in and help with some of the you know, appraisal. Now, the emotions are important. You have to get those out. I always tell all my mentees, never send an emotional response to an email on a Friday. Because people just have a tendency to send these things out. They want it off their list and then they're like, oh. Wait until Monday. Give your frontal lobe the time to kind of, again, reappraise that. That's a great strategy for kids because now the context is they're at a party and someone offers them a beer or drugs or something and they know the right answer. They don't want to do it. And there's peer pressure and there's all sorts of stuff. And that amygdala is having one response and the frontal lobe is just kind of hanging out, maybe doing something or not. 10, 10, 10 rule. Tell them. If you're at a party and you're in an uncomfortable position, it doesn't have to be about drugs or alcohol. It could be about anything. Wait 10 seconds. Walk away, text someone, give that frontal lobe even 10 seconds of time to help put the brakes on a decision that they really don't want to make so that they don't have to be in that what were you thinking moment. And the other thing that Barbara Green always talks about is really using Socratic dialogue with your teens. That means having the discussions. What would happen if? Engage the frontal lobe to think about things. Rotate the perspective. I do it with my kids. They're five and three. I'm like, what do you think would happen if this or that? You set them up to actually think about consequences because right now the way the brain is wired when you're a teenager is you don't really think about the consequences, usually until it's already happened. And so that is the work that we've been doing. And so if we think about these developmental brain markers, we talked about the structure of the brain. We talked about the function of the brain. One of the most other really promising things that we could do with brain imaging is we can actually measure chemistry of the brain. So we can measure a neurochemical in the brain that's responsible for putting the brakes on. It's called GABA. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. That's the little chemical that kind of releases the neurons to either put the brakes on or keep going. This is something we can actually measure using brain imaging. Non-invasively, we can measure chemistry in the brain. And so here's our Stroop test. And a lower bar here means that they did better. So this is the difference between 12 to 14 year olds and 18 to 22 year olds doing the Stroop test in how many errors they made. If you actually have a window into the brain and we are interested in that frontal lobe because we know that frontal lobe's coming online last, you can kind of see it in this little picture here that the line for the 12 year olds is definitely lower. But if you actually look at the bar graph, you know, this is six years of time in one's life. This is the second decade of life. And six years later, your performance is better, you're more accurate, and you have more of the neurochemical in your brain, GABA, that helps you put the brakes on. So, I mean, that's pretty dramatic. It's 30% higher. And this is just a healthy, normative, developmental time course. So what does that mean? You know, what is the whole GABA piece of the story? There's, 
I have a colleague at BU who always teases me because I love GABA. Um, so much that she said that I was gonna name my first child GABA. Um, I did not, <coughs> Luca. But why is GABA so important to kind of link in with these other pieces of things? This is an incredibly important neurochemical. Oh, if you look at people with depression, with anxiety, with alcohol dependence, that use marijuana, that have social phobia, guess what? They have low levels of GABA in their brain, typically in their frontal lobe. So this is a neurochemical that develops in a normative way, helps to put the brakes on, and is altered in a number of conditions. So if you think about it, if when you're young, you have low GABA, that kind of sets you up to be vulnerable to a whole host of things. And so, you know, one quick thing that we know is, this is always a surprise to someone. So if we were gonna do an experiment, which I would not do, because this would be unethical, but let's say for the sake of science, we were gonna do this. We have a teenager, we have an adult. We give them the same amount of alcohol based on their body weight, so they're getting the same effective dose, and we have them walk the line. The adult will swagger back and forth. They will clearly know that they're intoxicated. The adolescent will walk from here to there. You would have no idea they were exposed to alcohol. That sounds surprising, right? We found this in animal models. They are significantly less impaired by the sedative or the motor impairing effects of alcohol than adults are. So what does that mean? Have you ever said to yourself, oh, I can't drink like I used to. One glass of wine and I wanna lay my head down on the table. I mean, as we get older, we get more sensitive to alcohol effects. But when you're young, the things that tell adults to stop drinking, I'm tired, I'm slurring, I'm walking, you know, swaggery, those don't happen in teenagers until significantly higher blood alcohol levels. They have to drink a lot more to get to that effect. Does that surprise anybody? Other side of the coin though. If we have the same adult, the same teenager, based on their body weight, drink the alcohol, give them a list of words to recall, so now use your memory. The adult, while they're intoxicated, will remember practically the entire list. The adolescent will remember about half. So there's a mismatch. Motor impairment and sedation from alcohol, not as impairing for kids. So they come home, they walk the line, maybe they drink vodka, you can't smell it on their breath, you'd have no idea they're intoxicated. Ah, but when they come home, give them a list of words to recite. <laughs> Why is this important? What is the job of a teenager sitting in a classroom? To learn and to remember. And one of the, most imp one of the biggest things we see is that alcohol impairs learning and memory. Marijuana impairs learning and memory. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I want you to have that in your mind as you go, as we go forward. One of the reasons why they're probably not as effective by the sedation or the motor impairment of alcohol is something to do with GABA. When GABA levels are low, you have to drink more to get to that same sleepy effect. Because adults have higher GABA, that might be one of the reasons why you're more effective in that regard. When it comes to learning and memory though, it's the opposite side of the story. So again, in the, face of in the face of tough choices, the frontal lobe provides inhibitory control over the more rapid amygdala responses. These are developmental changes that are occurring that really help improve your cognitive control. This is only coming online as teens are really faced with making difficult decisions and navigating emotional responsiveness. So the more that amygdala lights up under conditions of emotion, the harder that frontal lobe has to work. Oh, and by the way, how many people in this room would say that you're sleep deprived right now? It's okay, there's no judgment. I'm just curious, how many people feel like you could have gotten a little more sleep and you're dragging a little bit today? Most people. If you take a room of people that are, got a good night of sleep in a room of people, or another side of the room that are sleep deprived and you have them do the Stroop test, the group that is sleep deprived will perform significantly worse, so much that it looks like their performance, it looks like they were intoxicated. That is how damaging sleep deprivation can be on the brain. You don't get enough sleep, you don't have enough energy to help, remember, the frontal lobe requires a ton of energy to put the brakes on, more so than any other behavior. Ah, so maybe it's coming together now. Why do I make those poor food choices? When I'm sleep deprived, I haven't slept enough, I actually find that cheeseburger even more appealing. That's because the frontal lobe, when you're tired, has to work even harder. So under conditions of sleep deprivation, you might need a 12-12-12 rule so on and so forth. So, you know, that's the whole idea here. And these brain changes are ongoing as teens are starting to initiate drugs and alcohol, or the experimentation of alcohol and drugs. So, just to kind of give you a little overview of what's going on nationally, epidemiologic studies, this is a figure showing uh, what the patterns of drinking are. So typically, you know, about 2% of the population start to drink when they're 12 to 13. This goes up from 2% 
from 12 to 13, six years later, it goes from 2% to 70%. Now, what do you notice? In the second decade of life, there is the most dramatic escalation in how many people start to drink than any other time in life. The second decade of life is also when your brain is doing the most important development of your brain. Not to say the first 10 years aren't important, but that's a different type of important. So not only is it for, you know, this is just current use, not binge use, we also see a dramatic increase. By the time people are in this category, 21 to 25, about 40% of the population at this age binge drink. And what binge drinking means is that if you're female, it's four or more drinks within a given session of drinking, typically about two hours, to raise your blood alcohol to 0.08. So if you are male, it's five drinks, but the idea here is that you drink within a two-hour span enough alcohol that brings you to the legal limit. Well, probably the most important statistic that I like to share is how there's a relationship between the age of first use of alcohol and incidence or risk of alcoholism later in life. If you start drinking when you're 13, there's about a 47% chance that someone will have an alcohol use disorder later in life. If they wait until they're 16, it goes down to 32%. If they wait until they're 18, it goes down to 17%. Even if you wait until the legal age to drink, 21, it's 9%. It is never zero. It is zero if you never drink alcohol. You will never have an alcohol use disorder if you don't drink alcohol. That's the good news. But the idea here, and you know, I've had many parents say, I can't help but think about the first time I drank, and I'm looking at this list, and I'm doing, let's concentrate on the teenagers of today whose brains are really dealing with things in a way that our teenage brains or your teenage brains, it's a different world for them. Things are faster, there's more information, there's more you know, um, distraction, there's more need for attention. So let's think about teenagers today starting to drink during a time when, I'm not saying brain development was less important when we were teenagers. I'm just saying that there's different demands on the system today. So importantly, we know the age of first use, when the brain is trying to develop that decision-making machinery, the younger you are when you drink, the greater the likelihood of a use disorder, an alcohol use disorder later in life. And that's not for everybody. There are people that start young that don't follow this pattern. There are people that start later and have an alcohol use disorder. So this is just a guideline to say that the age of first use is a really strong predictor of use. So the argument here, this is not a just say no campaign. This is a delay onset of first use as long as you can until the brain has done the, the bulk of its work. What about marijuana use? All over the news, big hot topic in Massachusetts. Over the last 10 years alone, we've seen a doubling in the percentage of kids that use marijuana. I can only imagine how things get rolled out that there will be more availability. Um, you know, uh, Carol could probably speak for four days on this topic. But the idea here, and the, the part that's really important, that there is a huge link between teenage marijuana use and rates of depression. And some people make the argument, well, maybe they're self-medicating their depression, or maybe the depression is making them want marijuana. We don't know, but they really do coexist. So there's a greater likelihood of depression in marijuana users than vice versa. I'll show you some of the brain science in a moment. But probably one of the more discouraging pieces of information is this pattern. So I think as neuroscientists, we've done a good job. There's been a dramatic decrease in the number of kids who drink and drive. They know that that's really harmful. However, their position on using marijuana in driving is very, very different. Their perception of risk or harm from marijuana is way lower. They think that there are no harms associated with marijuana use. Now, just to remind you, these are not my personal opinions. This is the science. This is what it's telling us. And so if they don't view it as risky, so a colleague of mine at McLean, Kevin Hill, was quoted in The Globe, and it really kind of sums it up like this. If you drink and drive, you kind of blow through the red lights. If you use marijuana and drive, you actually stop at green lights, <laughs> right? And so, you know, it, it's kind of a funny concept, but if you think about kids and they think that it's not harmful because they're getting a message that, you know, there's medical marijuana and it's a legal thing, I can tell you there were no neuroscientists who knew about brain development that went into any of this planning. And so now our work is what's the impact going to be and how can we safeguard them? Because they could be walking along and be like, oh, look, a gummy bear. Huh. I just had four times the typical potency of THC in my system. So we know that you know, marijuana from the 60s and 70s has increased at least fourfold in potency since, since the 60s and 70s. Now it is so, 
so pure, sometimes synthetic, it is way stronger. This is not the marijuana of you know, the hippie days. This is a different chemical in and of itself, and we don't know enough. Like, we have a, we have a good idea that it's gonna affect teenage brains. We also don't know what it's gonna do in adults who start to use more. So I think there's a ton of work to be done, and over the next decade, a lot of people will be collecting these types of uh, data. So one thing they always highlight, and this is important for kids, I think, because they always fall prey to the everybody's doing it, right? So if you look in eighth graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders, this is the prevalence of, how, of the percent past month of alcohol use, cigarette use, and marijuana use. And you can see that it really increases dramatically by the time they're in 12th grade. But if you kind of take this perspective, this is the percentages of kids that don't use. So that's an important point. There are more, way more kids that don't use than do. And so if that's what motivates kids to want to use because everyone's doing it, who really is the everyone? This is just the epidemiology. This is not a advice or just thought. This is just something for you to think about, is that actually less kids are using than are using. So that's an important piece because people have a perspective or a perception of what's going on, and that's not you know, social norms. They think that something is happening when, in fact, the data suggest otherwise. And then, of course, you know, just to comment briefly on opioid crisis and prevalence, we know that you know, from the age 12 to 13, this is about 1%, going up to about 3%. It's not as high. It's increasing. These are old data. It's increasing dramatically. We know that 22% of first-time illicit drug use, they typically start with controlled medications such as Vicodin or OxyContin, something that they've found in a cabinet somewhere or they've, you know, they've been prescribed for an injury or something like that. Um, very limited data available on the effects of prescription drugs on the adolescent brain. If you look for a paper in adolescent opioid users, you will find nothing. That's because they're collecting this information. Now we are in the crisis and it takes time to recruit the subjects, get the funding, do the studies, figure out what it means and then publish it. But I will tell you, this is another thing that will be coming out in the next five to 10 years is what is it doing to the teenage brain? So according to the science, what does the brain science look like? As I indicated about alcohol, we know that adolescents who continue, you know, that uh, consistently use alcohol do about 10% worse on tests of memory. What does that mean? So when I talk to kids, I tell them, well, that's the difference between an A and a B. If you're doing about 10% worse, or a B and a C, or a C and a D, I'll grab the questions at the end if you don't mind. Um, and so what happens when you have a window into the brain? What we know is, here's another example of a task where you're laying in the scanner, I'm not gonna make you do this one, but you're laying in the scanner and you have to keep track of the location of the icon, and when you see a repeat, you have to press a button. And so what we wanna know is we wanna identify when the targets appear in the same location. This is what I like to call holding something in the clipboard of your mind. I mean, we have smartphones, we have all sorts of technology to help our memories, but if I were to give you my phone number and ask you to remember it, you'd be like 617-855-2920, shh, don't talk to me. It's, you'd have to just continually be repeating it back to yourself. It's a very energy intensive process to hold something in your mind. And if you look in, in the brain of when the brain is activating, when the repeat target is in the correct location, what you see is that in teens who are non-drinkers, you actually see that they light up a lot of their brain, as they should. But in the group of teens who are alcohol users, now they're not intoxicated when they're performing this task, they actually light up significantly less of their brain. And so the fact that they do 10% worse on tasks of learning and memory suggests that exposure to alcohol in the brains of teenagers actually makes the brain significantly less efficient in re learning and remembering. It also means that there are residual effects. So you, so you drink on the weekend, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever the test rolls around, that doesn't go out of the system. I mean, the alcohol leaves your system, but the effect on neurons actually stays. So it stays a little bit of time. There are these residual effects. And so importantly, you know, this is kind of the window into the brain to say, wow, alcohol exposure during the teenage period actually makes the brain less efficient when it comes to learning and memory. So chicken or the egg? How do you know those kids didn't have different brains to begin with? That's a very valid question. So the way we wanted to address this is we used the Stroop task, and what we did was we compared teens who were the same age, they hadn't started using alcohol or drugs yet, but they differed in the fact that they had a positive family history for alcoholism, so a parent and or a grandparent. And what we found is when we separated those groups, there was actually, now they didn't differ in performance, they performed equally well. However, 
in the teens who had a positive family history for alcoholism, they actually had to activate more brain to perform at the same level. So again, this is not better or worse. This is different. So that just might mean that kids who have a family history of addiction might actually need a 12-12-12 rule. They might need a couple extra seconds for that frontal lobe to put the brakes on. And so, you know, that, that it is what it is. Our genetics are what they are. And so understanding that family history of risk actually has a big impact is an important part of the story. Listen, I understand as a teenager it's hard to make good decisions. Oh, you know what? You might you have a family history of alcohol. It might actually be a little bit harder. So we think this is what confers risk in the brain. So again, it's not better or worse, it's just different. And so the brain is wired in a slightly different way. So what about marijuana? What do you want to know about the effects of marijuana on brain function? There have been many studies, this is kind of the classic study that essentially at the end it studied, uh, it looked at cannabis use at ages 18, 21, 26, 32, and 38. The end of the conclusion was that if you have an early onset of marijuana use, your IQ is about eight points lower. Okay, there's been some criticisms of this study, but importantly many other groups have gone on to study the same thing. So in the same groups of teens, this is a group of 40 adolescents who are 15 to 19, half, of, half were marijuana users and 21 were non-users. What you find is that there are dramatic deficits in attention in kids who use marijuana. So three days after use, they're not actively intoxicated here, it's in their system, they're still affected whether it's three days, two weeks, or three weeks later, you can actually see that their attention is worse. You can see that uh, at three days in particular, there were significant decrements in learning, and we also see that there were some decrements in working memory. So again, that clipboard of your mind. So, you know, whether you're an adult, or you're a teen, or whether you are male or female, if you have a brain cell and you expose it to alcohol or you expose it to marijuana, it changes the function. And that does not discriminate across people. It cha drugs change the function. And it just so happens, you know, there are a lot of people who have really appropriate relationships with alcohol or who don't. But what we know is that, you know, 30% of the population are going to probably be moderate drinkers in their life. 30% of the population will be heavy drinkers in their life. And 30% of the population will be really light or won't drink then there's that other little percentage that you know maybe are somewhere in between. But the idea here is that most people will go on to have some relationship with alcohol at some point in their life. And so, you know, marijuana as well, that's a different kind of story, um, especially as things change legally. But we see kind of the same idea if you have the window into the brain with memory. So remember this task where you had to hold in your mind the location of that target. What you see is if you compare teens who are marijuana users to teens who are not marijuana users, and again, they are actually uh, not intoxicated here, but what you see is that the blue represents the fact that the teenager's brain who's the marijuana user actually lights up less of their brain, so they don't activate the part of the brain that they should be when they're trying to hold that information in their brain, but when they're at rest, so now they're not doing anything, they're just laying in the scanner in between the test, what you actually find now is that they actually activate more of their brain. So there's a mismatch. So they're supposed to be activating brain when they're doing the task and they're not, but when they're resting their brain is supposed to be quiet and now the brain is overactive. So there's a mismatch in terms of how the brain is activating and when. <coughs> and then finally if you look at the Stroop task, now you're all expert, uh, expert neuroscientists on this task, we know that this is an example of really efficient brain activation when you have to hold back the want and need to read. If you look in teens who are marijuana users, again, not intoxicated at the time of performance, but what you see is it doesn't just take two areas of activation to perform uh, this task. It takes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven areas of activation. So I like to think about it this way. You have two teenagers getting ready to run a 50 meter dash. Only one, one teenager has on a backpack of bricks. Now, will it take you more energy to run a 50 meter dash with a backpack of bricks on? Absolutely. Could you do it? Sure. Could you run a mile? Could you run two miles or a marathon? Probably. Are you going to run out of steam a lot sooner? Also, probably. And so the idea here is that exposure to substances during this period of life, when the brain is trying to put all its energy into developing, it kind of, you know, detracts the brain a little bit. Now the good news, the other thing that imaging shows us is the brain can recover. So, you know, whether you use alcohol or you have a use disorder or you use marijuana and you stop using, the brain can actually recover. And that's great news. So I often like to tell teens, 
you know, the, the longer you can delay onset of first alcohol use, the better. If you've already started, because chances are, I have an audience of a thousand teenagers, some percentage of those kids have started using alcohol already, the quicker you stop, let your brain kind of get back on track, you know, the brain can actually recover very well. As I said, we have a lot of redundancy in our brain, and that's a good thing. But we also know that things like alcohol and marijuana use actually impair brain function, but it also impairs our ability to make good decisions. And so, you know, the other thing that we see is that GABA, that, that uh, neurochemical we talked about before, also lower in teens who use marijuana. And so it's kind of conclusive evidence across a number of different types of imaging that all converge in the same place to say that the teenage brain is particularly sensitive and vulnerable to substances when it's trying to do its development. And then, you know, just to leave you with this, like I said, there are no adolescent studies on prescription drugs. So I had to lean on some of the adult literature. And what we see is that in this study of adults who were administered heroin, it actually reduces the activation of the amygdala. Remember, the amygdala is supposed to light up to fear. What you actually find is that heroin or opioids reduce the activation of the amygdala to fearful stimuli or to things that the brain is supposed to be you know, noticing to keep it safe. And so how much the amygdala activates was actually related to anxiety, to stress, and to craving for heroin. So that same important system we know is online already in teenagers is really impacted by heroin use. And, you know, drug users typically uh, who claim to use oxycodone say to dampen the physical and emotional pain. We know that the amygdala is very important for uh, emotions, but we also know that oxycodone in particular attenu attenuates that frontal lobe, being able to be connected to the other parts of the brain. So two important players here. It almost doesn't matter that these studies weren't done in kids. We know the parts of the brain that are impacted by opioids are the frontal lobe and the amygdala. Those are the players that are developing during adolescence. And so, you know, alterations in these neural pathways really may underlie the pathophysiology of drug abuse. It just so happens that heroin and oxycodone, opioid-related substances, are incredibly addictive. You take it one time, and there's already a craving. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of the idea here. And I won't talk about this too long, but we could spend probably weeks talking about the cycle of addiction. And when I talk to kids, it's a really hard concept to tell them, you know, they don't have an addiction. It's hard to explain that they could develop one, and they might not even know it. And so I've been to some talks before where there's someone who's in recovery, which is amazing. Um, I think an adult can appreciate someone in recovery in a different way because teenagers have a tendency to look at people in recovery and say, they look fine. They kind of can't get the picture and they can maybe tell a story of everything that happened to them, but that is a hard thing for them to put together. You know, it's almost like what they're seeing is, is in conflict with what they know. And so I always am working constantly on ways to explain to kids what it means to have an addiction. And that's a really hard conversation because it's about it's really an abstract thought, and that's the part of the brain that's coming online. When you don't have something, it's hard to imagine you having it if you don't already. And so, you know, this is an important piece of the work. And so the last two slides I'll just share with you, this is where science is headed. So this is really hot off the presses. There's a paper that was recently published, and you don't have to pay attention to anything except for my one little phrase that, that really summarizes the study. Adolescent alcohol exposure can change your genes. We used to think the genes were fixed that you could not alter your genetic code. What we find now is that if you have exposure to alcohol, and this, these are all studies that have been done in animal models, if an adolescent is exposed to alcohol during the adolescent period, it actually alters their genes. This is really new information. Genetic modification by a substance during adolescence is really important information. The other piece, Again, you don't have to pay attention to anything except for this. Parental exposure to drugs can transcend generations. There was a study that came out that showed that if the grandparent generation was exposed to marijuana, to THC, two generations later, the offspring that would be the grandchildren actually were more sensitive to marijuana effects and to opioids than were the other generations. So what does that mean? You know, if you think about the folks in the 60s who may be grandparents now who may have used marijuana, just exposure to their genes to THC actually goes through the generations so that it actually sets up the kids. This is not a, a blame or a fault. This is just what 
happens with genetics. We are exposed to all sorts of things, but we actually know that that has an impact on how teenagers respond or their sensitivity to drugs, in particular to opioids and to marijuana. So they might actually appraise it, they might find it more rewarding, they might crave it more, based on what's happened genetically during time. Again, this is really new information. This is all done in animal models, but it's something to just keep in the back of our minds that genetics are not fixed and genetics can be altered. That could also be a good thing, but for now, you know, this is some of the first evidence. This is really, uh, really new stuff um, that's kind of interesting to think in the context of everything we've discussed. So I'm just gonna leave you with a quick little summary. Second decade of life, people think about this in two ways period of opportunities, period of, of vulnerabilities. Are you a glass half full? Or are you a glass half empty person? It's a little bit of both. Depends on the day, depends on the mood, depends on a whole host of things. Stress, we could talk about stress. Kids are under a lot of stress. There's a lot of competition. There are a lot of things going on. It's all working on the same system. With each year comes much change. So risk for alcohol use disorders declines significantly each year a teen waits to drink for the first time from 47% at age 13 to 9% at 21. It is never zero, again, unless you don't drink. For some, risk is greater. For some, risk is less. If you have a genetic disposition or you, know, you have a, a whole host of things, you can have differing levels of risk. Scientific evidence is clear. The brain is undergoing crucial development during the teenage years. That is undisputable. The brain does important work. We have a machine, we have technology to image it. And we see that this is changing. Drinking and drug use can significantly derail this process. So what does that mean? It can derail it, it could get back on the rail. Some kids will have gone through this, they may be okay. They may overcome it, there may be redundancy. There's a lot we don't know. But now more than ever, we have an ability, the study that we're conducting right now that was alluded to in the beginning is we're actually recruiting 13 to 14 year olds for a three year brain imaging study. And these three, 13 to 14 year olds have never used substances. They have no anxiety, no depression. And we are studying them for a three year period, hopefully longer if we get renewed funding. And what we're trying to look at is some percentage of those kids that we enroll into the study will go on to be depressed or anxious or use marijuana or use alcohol or all of the above. And so what we're hoping is that if we have a window into the brain when they're 13 and 14, before anything has happened to them, can we look at the signature of their brain and make predictions about who's at greatest risk? And so, you know, they get a brain scan three years in a row and we can compare the same person year to year to year. And we actually keep in touch with them in between because we want to do assessments. Have you tried this? Have you tried that? What's your stress? What are, you know, how are you sleeping? And we want to see if we can actually make predictions about the brain. So I know you've gotten that flyer. I have a couple here. There's more on the table. Um, feel free to even email me if you have questions about it or if you know some teenagers who would be interested. There's a lot at stake. So the idea here is help teens protect their best asset, their brain. So again, just an even briefer summary, time when emotions are strong and can be hard to manage. What is our goal? As a neuroscientist, I often, you know, people ask me what is my elevator speech and I tell them I study the neurobiology of what were you thinking? And you know, that's kind of funny, but that is what I do. I want to understand how the brain does or does not work in the face of having to make decisions. And our whole goal is, you know, we, we are really remiss if we keep the science in the lab. So part of my goal and part of why I really appreciate these invitations is that I want to be your neuroscience interpreter. I want to help understand, I want to help bring the science to people so that you can actually use it um, to help ultimately kids make better informed decisions. And if adults make better decisions along the way, you know, everybody's <laughs> better off. Um, kids really love this content as I alluded to. This is a letter that I received from a student who I never even met. They just sent me this letter. They read a blog post about some of the work I was doing. Um, I think uh, we talked about the work you do with teen brains. I think that's really cool. Isn't it weird to watch someone's brain think? I think that waiting to drink until you're 21 so your frontal lobe is developed is smart. I'm going to wait. This is a middle school student. I hate forgetting things and want to get good grades, so I think not drinking will help. Your work is really important. I hope you enjoy what you do. And then I had, I gave this presentation at a, at a big school in uh, Washington, D.C., and they were given this evaluation. And the kid that filled out this evaluation actually drew this picture for me, told me they were going to protect this. And then we asked them to please set at least one goal. And their one goal, and I gave this presentation probably five or eight years ago, um, was wait to drink. So if it's something that simple, you know, that's something that's manageable. It's not never, it's just wait. And I guess, you know, we could really say we could think about the same thing as it pertains to marijuana, as we learn more. 
Um, so you can go to uh, this blog post through McLean Hospital. These are the top five questions. These may be your questions that you wrote on your cards. So I will take some question and answers, but if you wanna see my longer answer to some of the most common questions I get at these presentations, they're actually available. Um, why do teens binge drink? I hope you understand that now. Their brain is wired to be less affected by the sleepy parts of alcohol and the fact that a lot of kids not only drink alcohol, but they also mix in caffeine with it. So if, caf if alcohol wasn't making the teens sleepy and you add in caffeine, it's gonna make them even less sleepy. So again, it's going to really mask the effects of alcohol that adults use as feedback to let you know when you've had enough. Anyway, I won't go through these all now, but you are welcome to uh, go to that site. I wanna acknowledge my fantastic team, my collaborators, our funding sources. And um, at this time, we can either collect the cards if you have questions on those, or you can ask me questions whatever you would like. And as I said, um, if you are interested in being a participant for our research, we are recruiting, as I said, adolescents 13 to 14, that's a three-year study. We're also recruiting college freshmen. So if you have a college freshman who just finished their freshman year or come back to us in September when they've started their freshman year, that's a study to look at 18-year-olds to figure out what their brain tells us about risk for later alcohol behavior consequences. Um, so that's a single study and then we're also recruiting women that are 18 to 55 with and without depression, also a brain imaging study. So you can call, you can email, and with that I thank you for your attention and I will take some questions. So as Dr. Silveri said, she'll take questions if people are comfortable raising their hands and just asking out loud. And while that's happening, um, we're also going to collect the index cards and she'll be able to read um, questions from and you had a question. Yes. On your, on your earlier slide, I think it was about adolescent alcohol consumption or memory data, and it referred to, I think it was consistently. Yeah. So my question was really, what is consistently? So not not one-time users, recreation kids who use recreationally on weekends. So not necessarily alcohol use disorder, not just tried it once, but kids who consistently use alcohol. Um, you know, I had that question one time from a student, and they said, oh, you know, how much were they drinking? And I'm trying to think of the paper and give them the numbers back. I was like, wow, they are really engaged. They really want to know the details. How much can I drink without getting a brain that looks like that? I, I have a question. Sure. You said you're taking um, adolescents from 13 to 14 who are not depressed and don't have anxiety. How do you know that? At we do clinical assessments on them. Okay. Yeah, we actually are also starting another uh, study in the summer that's recruiting 13 to 14 year olds with and without depression. And I have a collaborator at BU because uh, we are looking at yoga as an intervention for depression. And what we actually find is that a 12 week regimen of yoga, so twice a week with some homework, actually improves mood, decreases anxiety in people that are clinically diagnosed with depression. It improves their brain GABA it changes how their brain functions and they feel better. So we're actually doing the same study in kids because we already know their GABA is low. We anticipate that kids with depression will have even lower GABA. And how glorious would it be to have a non-invasive, non-pharmacologic intervention for depression for kids that actually changes their brain chemistry. So um, that's gonna be another one coming down the line. But we do, we have clinicians who work on our team who do the assessments. Yes. So there, there is a marijuana use disorder, so you can have a dependence on marijuana. So even though people have said it's not addictive, it actually does meet criteria for an addictive disorder. So that's kind of a, a, a little bit of a myth. But the other piece that we know is that if you use marijuana at a younger age, in the earlier part of adolescence, it really has a dramatic impact on your cognitive abilities later. So, you know, the younger you use, Decision making, attention, all of those cognitive functions do differ based on, you know, the earlier the use. They don't quite have the same setup for the statistics, but I bet now 
mostly because that's been an illegal drug up until now. But you know that information is coming along. But we do know that the younger the onset of use of marijuana, the greater the likelihood. There's also a lot of evidence to suggest that marijuana use also co-occurs with the onset of uh, psychotic disorders or psychosis. So having um, psychiatric illness in terms of not schizophrenia necessarily, but some of the prodrome to that. So having psychotic features are actually associated with younger marijuana use as well. Yeah. You say the brain recovers from prolonged use. It can recover. Do you know how long it takes? I know um, where I work, we do a lot of drug testing and see you know, if someone's still on a drug. But as far as the brain goes, if someone's sober, how long does that take? Get back on track. Depends on the drug. So the oh, the question was, if the brain can recover, how long does it take? So part of it is that there can be really rapid recovery. You could, if you have someone who has an alcohol use disorder and they are abstinent for a week, you can actually see an improvement in brain chemistry and you can actually see a recover of cognitive function. But that that requires that they don't drink again. So the bigger challenge is the risk for relapse. So the brain could recover neurobiologically, but it doesn't mean that the craving will go away. There are the situational aspects of drug use, the I'm in a context, it makes me crave it, or when I'm under stress, I, I am more craving. So those are the pieces you can't take away. You could, the biology can write itself. It could look like someone it can more, more likely resemble someone without a use disorder after a period of abstinence. So I gave the example of after seven days for alcohol use disorder. By 30 days, it's even better. If you wait even longer, it gets better and better and better. And in some people who have very severe alcohol use disorder and have a lot of alterations in their cognition, they can really improve. Could they get to you know, the level of someone who never used or never had an alcohol use disorder? Probably not. The interesting thing about marijuana is that it takes time for marijuana to leave the system. 35 days. So in adults, it takes about a month for them to recover back to the way they were. It actually takes adolescents twice as long. So it takes adolescents 60 days for marijuana to go out of their system and for their cognitive abilities to recover. So that's a drug specific thing. If we're talking about opioids, which are highly addictive, there is a withdrawal syndrome that's also associated with that. And you know that might take some days or some pharmacological intervention to get through that. So it really depends on the abuse liability of the drug. It depends on whether we're talking about kids or adults. Um, but the good news is that people like to see evidence that the brain can recover. I think that's part of hope. So I had one back here first, and then I'll get you next. Yes. Yes. So that was, that's the point of what we hope the yoga study will do. So we know that people with insomnia or sleep disorders, you know, they have uh, disturbed sleep, they have low brain GABA. So sleeping more is one possible way that you can improve your brain GABA levels. Um, yoga looks like, in, even in healthy people, gives you a little yo uh, GABA boost. Um, so probably some of the mindfulness and meditation, but also the stretching in the postures. Has, there's input from your vagal nerve, so your system that's kind of your sympathetic nervous system actually gives feedback and it's linked into your GABA system. The other thing that's really interesting is that if you look at women in different phases of their menstrual cycle, you know, we talk about people are naturally cycling, not on oral contraceptives. They actually have significantly different levels of GABA in different parts of their cycle. So women in the luteal phase, just after ovulation, have significantly lower GABA. That's why we walk into things and get a little more confused, because your GABA's low. When you're in the follicular phase, we say that women are more hormonally male-like. So, you know, you're not as affected. Well, let's just think about a woman who's in recovery, who happens to be in her luteal phase, who has really low GABA, could be at greater risk for relapse or not. So there are a number of natural things that are linked to GABA that I think people, now that we can measure GABA, because it's only really been about 10 years, I actually came to McLean Hospital because the director at the time said, did you know we can measure GABA? I was like, sign me up. So to the, to the extent that we can measure it in the parts of the brain that are relevant, we can now look for ways to manipulate it. And so Zolpidem or you know, sedative drugs, they all enhance GABA levels. They're called GABA agonists. Alcohol 
increases GABA levels. And so if you start to put these things together, you're like, oh, the things that are also not necessarily good for me can boost GABA. That's why they are partially you know, rewarding. And so these are all the pieces of things we're putting together. But I am all for finding some intervention for kids that will bolster GABA. Because even in healthy kids, who couldn't use better inhibitory control? I think they're, oh, yes. Um, Short term memory. <laughs> show the effects of recovery on the brain. So for an adolescent, the marijuana would be like 60 days. So for an adolescent, and you're trying to explain to them all the effects, yep. and they just hear it, oh, swap, 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 swap. Yeah. They don't listen or anything. Is there any opportunity that you could go somewhere and have an MRI done? And then, like, so you can Yeah. So MRI today, is not a precision medicine tool. What that means, it is not on an individual basis. It's not like I could get in the scanner, look at my brain pattern. Everything I showed you today are groups of kids, and it's an average of those groups of kids. There's a lot of individual variability. Maybe someday, 10 years, although the physicist who occupies the office next door to me, I'm like, so really, when are we gonna get that tabletop MRI that will be in every pediatric office for our well visits? <laughs> He says we're a little further out than 10 years, but I'm optimistic. But I think that's the idea. Yes, this is based on averages, and I think the conversation for teens around marijuana use is, you know what, exposure to any drugs that aren't supposed to be there make your brain less efficient. And it takes time for your brain to recover the efficiency. And there's no way to do that yet on an individual basis. I mean, there are cognitive tests people could take, but again, you compare your performance to an average of people. It's hard because people are different, and we want people to be different. Girls are different than boys. There are all sorts of uh, pieces of this. So, but for now, you know, I think they find the brain science in the fMRI studies pretty credible in terms of, wow, yeah, well, I'll believe that. The brain really does activate differently. So. Thank you. Well, thank you for your attention and for staying. I, I got you three extra minutes. Thank you. Thank you.